Let's give a round of applause. This is our first ever live stream. It's exciting. So, so this is going to be really good. Um, we're actually going to be, we have Heather Ferroni with us today. She's going to be super cool. Um, I mean, I know that she's kind of been doing a lot. If you guys know Heather Ferroni, um, I have some questions to actually ask you before we actually go into uh -oh. our Q&A session. Okay. But um, I did want to ask you, you know, tell me a little bit about yourself so that we can kind of have our students and then everyone who's going to be watching. Um, just tell me just a little bit about yourself, maybe something, just you in general, maybe okay. like where you're from and then what's something sure. that you enjoy. Okay, cool. So first off, thanks for having me guys. I'm glad to be here. Um, one thing you should probably know if you haven't gotten already is that, like my energy level is like, you know, through the roof. Okay, so you can thank Jesus and coffee for that. So highly caffeinated, but I'm just excited to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Thanks guys for having me. Um, it's such an honor. It really is such an honor. So, so thank you for that. A little about me. I mean, I'm like half Italian and like super spicy and, you know, tons of energetic and Holy Spirit is my best friend and we got to that place actually when I was in high school. So around your age, um, I had a high school friend that put a Bible in my hand for the first time and I remember sitting in my classes in like junior, senior year and um, and was just looking through the Bible and it was just underlining things and taking notes and stuff and I got really excited about it. Um, and I wish I could say that I've been like super holy ever since, but actually most of my 20s was living like a knuckleheaded 20 year old, you know? You know what I'm saying? Like just not making the best choices and stuff. So I knew of Jesus as, as Savior, you know, as a ticket into heaven, you know what I'm saying? Um, but he was not my Lord, meaning like the, the guide and the director of my life um, until 11 2 14, November 2nd, 2014, where I had a really cool encounter with the Lord. And ever since then, my life has completely changed. And so that's what kind of brings me here today. What cool. am I passionate about? All yes. things kingdom. Hey, that's what it's about. Yeah, I'm not so much into churchianity. You know, like, let's go to church. Let's play church. I'm super passionate about the ways of God and, like, kingdom and actually being the church and actually helping people be um, awakened and empowered to who, who you are in Christ and how God made you and who you are and what he has for you and l watching you live out and walk out in your destiny because the world needs you right now where you're at at your age, at your school, in your family, in this area, there's a calling on your life. And so that's what I get passionate about is talking to people and helping them understand that. Yeah, which is going to be really cool because we have some really good questions I'm that excited. The students have asked. And honestly, I looked over them and I was a little surprised. I was like, dang, these are really they good were questions. Good. So yeah. we kind of, I sent them off to you to kind of look at and just get an idea. Right yeah. So, okay. um, you know, so we're going to start, we're going to pop up the few first few questions, but um, first of all, um, I did want to talk about one more thing, and sure. that is, you have a book coming out soon, <laughs> the idea of a book coming out, and, um, <laughs> yes, of so, uh, and this is your first book, correct? It is. So, I'm super excited, oh my um, gosh. man, like, just the idea, obviously, you have to go get published and all that. And so that's going to be crazy. But when it's released, I'm really excited for that. Um, yeah. Talk about like what that's about. Like what Thank what's you. the whole idea of breaking and remaking? Yeah. Yeah. So my book is called Breaking and Remaking, and it's really just a story of of my life um, and how I've came to faith. You know, a little bit more about that experience I shared with you about Holy Spirit um, entering my heart and how life has changed since then. Um, but it's also there's pressing and crushing that have happened in the last five years. And a lot of that has happened um, with other Christians and in churches. And I wasn't expecting that. You know, I wasn't expecting to be hurt by the same people on your own team. You know what I'm saying? Um, so it was challenging for me. But, you know, God is so good and his word is true when he promises to use all things to work together mm -hmm. for the good of those who love him. Romans 8.28. Hey. So, um, really, my story is not about the hurt. It's not about the pain. It's about how he made me into what he's made me into and, and what he 
what he taught me through that and how I grew through that. And I believe that this story is one that many can relate to. I think that it's more conversational than informational. Yeah. You know? And I think that it's honest. And I don't know. Do you guys crave honesty? Like people that are just really real. Anyone mm -hmm. else? Like not polished and pretty and all put together and PowerPoint, you know, like, but that are just really real. Straight up. And straight up. <laughs> I don't know about you, but those are the people that I like to learn from and I like to hear from because when when other people are too perfect and polished and poised and all that, um, they might be great communicators, they might be great information people, but are they allowing human, relational connection? Yeah. And relatability to where you can go, you know what, I. I felt that way, or I understand what that's like, or wow, like, she's real life. Um, so that's kind of what the book is about. Um, it's it's going to be different than a normal, like, you know, chapter book. How many of you are on Instagram? Is Instagram not cool anymore? Well, it's still cool. It's still cool? <laughs> okay. How many are on Snapchat? Is that more of a thing? What? Okay, so Instagrammers, hey. Um, well, so Instagram, you know how, like, do you have those little captions, and that's limited amount of text and right and so you can see like a, whole, a person's whole idea in one caption mm -hmm. so what I had realized is I share a lot of my story a lot of my life is on Instagram that's where I show up that's where I serve and minister a lot um, so I realized that a, my book actually came from the captions of my Instagram mm -hmm. so that's what you can expect it's, it's not going to be a boring old like here's my life <laughs> you know all right, so um, we're going to be going over some questions now. Um, okay. Before we start, for all the people who are watching live with us, um, so we're going to read off. I don't know if you guys can actually see the questions, but if you can't, we're going to still read them off to you. We're still going to um, kind of put that out there so you guys will actually get to see. Um, some of you guys have actually asked us questions on social media, which is great. So um, with that, we're actually going to take those questions and use them during this Q&A, which is really cool. So let's start with the first one. And so let's pop right. it up. So it says, why, why do people suffer from depression? So we have some of our wow. students ask these. You just come in hot with that one, <laughs> Pastor Isaiah. Oh my gosh. So why do people suffer from depression? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, okay, so you're going in. You're going in for it. Hey. You're going yeah. in for it. First off, I want to say that um, I, was a, I was a youth group leader a, um, a few months ago. And when I was talking to our youth, we, we raised our hands and we asked how many people, you know, really suffer with anxiety and depression. And I was absolutely surprised because every single person raised their hand. Mm -hmm. Every person. And that was alarming to me. Um, it was alarming to me because, you know, I'm 33, I'm a wolf, so... It's been a while since I've been a teenager, right? Like half my life ago. And so I didn't realize that the pressures that y'all face nowadays and the demands on your life and with schooling and education and the advent of social media and perception and, and there's just different types of pressure that you guys have that I didn't. And so I was alarmed to find that, that a lot of people do have depression. Here's what I can tell you. The question was, is is it God's will? What is it? So why do why? people suffer from depression? So we didn't why? have them all in the okay. order that I said. But here's what I can tell you. Um, I think there's many different factors. And I think what, what my advice would be to dig to find the answer is to dig out the root of depression. And to really ask the Lord to help you identify where did that enter my life? And where is it coming from? What I mean by that is, is it generational? Maybe your your parents or siblings in your house also suffer with, with a depressive type spirit. And so you've learned to be accustomed to that, right? That way of emotionally handling things. That could be a reason. Yeah. It could be biological. It could be just the way your body is being made up. You know, the function and the cells and the neurotransmitters and all of that, you know, the science of our bodies. It could stem from that. Uh, depression could come from circumstantial things. What's happening in your life 
and are how emotionally resilient are you to handling and processing what's going on in your world it could come from hormonal I mean guys we have hormones in our bodies we all do we all will and you know what they change all the time mm -hmm. Even as you age, that, that changes all the time. And then so that changes the way we think and how we think and how we respond to life. But the one I want to talk about today is the spiritual significance of depression and how I believe that throughout my study, because I myself have dealt with this yeah. a lot, like a lot, a lot, like a lot of people don't know that. And, and I think it's, a, it's multiple factors. So the way to get rid of it is to address it in all of those factors. If it's biological, what do I need to do to help change the chemistry of my body? If it's circumstantial, what do I need to do to, um, to focus more on what I can control about my life rather than what I cannot? If it's generational, like it's being modeled for you and your family, then you can make the decision to say, I'm not going to respond to life in that same way. And if it's spiritual, then you pray that sucker out. Okay? Because I think if we make friends with a spirit of depression, then it will linger within us. But I believe that you can, you can live empowered and you can pray against it and not agree with it. You can denounce the spirit of depression. You can reject it in your life. Don't make friends with it. I would say to you, I wrote down, claim your healing and maintain your healing when it comes to depression. Amen? Mm, amen. Okay. I think with that, um, too, adding on to that, which is really interesting, um, I've, I have dealt with, with anxiety as being such a big thing, big factor in my life, that has, it, at times in my life, has taken over just different parts of my life. And, yeah. and so um, it's really just a mind game is what it comes to as well. And our brains are, are wired a certain way. Yeah. Um, to actually, uh, anxiety is actually created in depression it, anxiety is created through depression. And so the idea is you actually have this little frontal lobe in the back, whatever, and what it does is it actually gives you a sense of awareness. So when something, when somebody jumps up in front of you and scares you, specifically, that person, you, you, you obviously will jump up or you have some type of reaction. And that's your body actually trying to go with it and, and decide if it's, if it's defensive or not yeah. and then that's when then you decide and then you have this logic part and the logic part actually like gives you the idea of what is specifically going to put that there where you're just like oh is that is that good or is it like actually am I in danger and so um, one thing that I've done too which is really interesting and I love this is in the past um, I take a sharpie or take an expo marker Put it right on your bathroom mirror and actually put positive things like i am good enough um like my life is is worth living for um, i am valued god cares about me different things that can you can you can actually go into because what's the first thing that we actually do when we get up in the morning majority of the time we get up in the morning and we use the restroom mm -hmm. so the first thing we're going to see in the morning when we get up is actually we're going to see, see some positive things. I get my and coffee. Hey, okay, that's another thing. But, yeah, but like, I'm a coffee maker. Okay. The great thing is, is it's what it's doing is it's actually rewiring your brain. Sure. So in such a way, because anxiety doesn't actually come from, from like God, uh, in a sense, it actually comes from the enemy. The enemy tries to scare us yeah. and put us in that place where we just feel That's born. just it. Is it. And I would say that if any of you or that are watching, um, want a little bit more information like what do you mean practically like how do I address that biologically generationally circumstantially or spiritually um, I think it's worthy of conversation yeah. and it's and it's I invite you guys to stay in touch with me or reach out let's let's talk about it you yeah. know like let's talk about it let's figure out what, what the root cause of that is and involve your people like your, your pastors you know and let them in on that and help let them help you navigate how to address that from multiple angles. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah that would be my advice. Yeah, so let's go on to the next question. Pop up the next question. Next question is, is it scary being an adult? Is it scary being an adult? Yes. Of course it is, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. 
It's a whole different Bills. season of change. Bills, Bills. work, work, yeah, yeah. So, so talk about that. Absolutely, it's scary, guys. But you know, isn't it scary being where you're at sometimes too? Fear's always gonna be around us. It doesn't matter how spiritual and holy you are. Fear's always gonna be around us. Um, what you do with that, however, it can really determine the course of your life. Um, as far as adulting goes, I mean. Like I said before, I don't I don't even know what it would be like you know, to be in your shoes. Um, as a youth pastor myself, you know, previous youth pastor, um, it was just it was just interesting to learn the, the different challenges that y'all face. Okay? But here, if anything, I can tell you this. Whether you're at where you're at or you're an adult, you are not meant to do life alone. The lie from the enemy, which is to isolate and just handle stuff on your own, or to be emotionally disconnected and just handle things on your own, because that's what you should do, I'm going to tell you today that is a lie. And we need each other. And you need people like pastors and guides and counselors and wise advisors, your advisory board in your life, whether you're a teenager or an adult. So if you hear anything for me today take take this you know take this home with you don't do life alone let people in to those places of your heart but i'm going to give you a warning be be discerning meaning choose wisely with who you allow into your life because there are going to be people who make it even scarier for you whether you're an adult or not you know what i mean there's a lot of people that want to conform you into the likeness of the image they think you need to be instead of who God made you to be. So get around people throughout your entire life now and even when you're old and gray and all wrinkly that you have people that you invite to speak into your life. That's going to help you. But more than that Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. He's our ultimate guide, our counselor and our advocate. And when you feel scared, this is what I told my nephew. My nephew's four. Yeah. I was hanging with him on Friday. And he said, Auntie, my, um, I had a bad dream. He was telling me about this nightmare that he had. And um, he's actually had like, nightmares and nightmares since he was like an infant. Hmm. And I said to him, he's four. His name's Clay. And I said, Clay, the next time you feel scared in your heart, you say, Jesus. Make this scared go away. Jesus, make this scared go away. And we can do that, you know, from four years old to you, all the way through our lives. That when we feel scared, when we feel fear, we can choose to invite Holy Spirit into that moment mm -hmm. and allow ourselves to be lifted up and strengthened through that. Gotcha. Yep. Cool. I think with that, um, scared being an adult, um, being. I was 18, like, three years ago, and not even three years ago, and there was a sense, you know, I started, I actually, for me, moved out before I was even 18, or, like, before I even graduated high school, let's just say that. Um, back in March? No, April. April of 2016, and uh, during this time, I had a few months left of school, and so I had to kind of just figure things out um, while still finishing high school, trying to finish up my grades, trying to finish up everything. And so for me, that was something that, um, it's scary, it really is. But I will tell you this, the most, I feel like at times we grow the most, and it's not necessarily in high school. In high school, we're figuring out the little things that what matters, we're focused on certain things, and we're also focused on just trying to enjoy ourselves. Um, just like through our high school. But one thing going into the adulthood is that is the time that you're going to grow the most. And I will tell you that from being, from the time I was 18 till now, that period of time, there you're going to find different seasons where they're going to be hard and it's gonna feel like you're down here. And then you're gonna have seasons where it's gonna feel like you're up here. You're gonna go through those seasons. and so. Be prepared for that because, like, that is something that we we, we, we will go through. And part of it is, is is it's actually so that we can, as people, be able to grow in the areas that we need to grow. Because 
things aren't easy in life, and so us as people have to actually go through the things, and God wants us to actually go through those things in order for us to be the best we can be yeah. and where he wants us. Yeah, that's good. And so um, going into that, let's go into the next question. We'll pop this next one right now. <clears throat> um, so what is marriage all about? So this, this, this one is kind of like a question that some of our students asked and maybe that I can answer, but if you've got yeah. anything on it, maybe that you can, based on maybe your parents or what you've seen in your family, and just kind of the connections there sure. um, that have come through that. So if you want to okay. talk about that just a little yeah. bit, it doesn't have to be crazy. Yeah, I was going to say, I, um, pretty simple, guys. Marriage is about covenant. Covenant is an unbreakable agreement, an unbreakable bond. It is not a contract. The world sees marriage as a contract and an agreement, like a business deal, and it's not. Um, it's sacred, and it was invented by God um, for his purposes. It's to glorify him. God calls us through Jesus to, to be co-creators with him. You know, he is the creator of the universe of all things seen and unseen. But he called us to co-create with him. He invites us to do that. Well, how do we co-create if we don't procreate? Come on, somebody, you know? And that's in the sanctity of marriage and the sacredness of marriage. That's where that happens. That's where life happens. But it's it's about, I think, it's one of my favorite subjects to study because I'm not married at 33. Which is, you know, I'm like, weird for that. <laughs> you know? Um, so it's one of my favorite things to study and to understand. I mean, yeah. I'll tell you this, guys. I have read more marriage books. Than, than you would even believe. It's Christian marriage books. And here's why I think that's important. If we're willing to go through school and get an education, get a degree, go to college, whatever that looks like for each of us, and invest our lives into educating ourselves for our future, why would we not do that for the greatest covenant, one of the greatest covenants mm -hmm. that we can have through, through marriage? Why wouldn't we want to study that? Why wouldn't we want to understand God's heart behind that? Why wouldn't we want to educate ourselves and to prepare our hearts for what does that mean to be a, what is a wife? What is a husband? And to be honest with you, because that's an eternal, that is forever. You know, that is, you're saying I do forever. Mm -hmm. That's a big commitment yeah. through that covenant. It would be my advice to learn, you know, to educate ourselves. Even from a younger age, because we want to honor God with our whole lives, right? We want to honor God with our marriage, even over our career, because careers can change. Yeah. But our marriage covenant doesn't. Yep. And here's what I can tell you about me being a, a single woman. I believe I am a wife. I don't need to know who my husband is to know that I am his wife. I am on reserve for him. I pray for him. Constantly, I write letters to my husband. I'm a, I'm a journaler. I'm a writer, obviously. I'm writing a book. So I write letters, and I have for, for many, many years. Yeah. Because I, I am a wife, and I want to prepare my heart and my life in order to, to be the wife that my husband, uh, that I've been praying for, really deserves. And, yeah. and I would, that would be my advice. You know, when talking to students, they're like, oh, that's not something I want to worry about. You know, that's something we can figure out later. My advice is, why? Because you're in your teenage years, and then you're kind of in that, like, early 20s, and, you know, you're going to school or whatever, and the world standards are, you know, to, to date and to, to hurry up and get married. Um, know what that means before you do that, you know? Involve your pastors. When it comes to relationships prior to marriage, invite the people in your life, the wise counselors, like I said before, and talk to them about it. Have them hold you accountable. Have them walk you through how to do relationships well. I'm telling you, I'm 33 years old, and the, the people that I've dated in my life, I have invited my pastors to meet, my pastors and my counselors to meet, even as a grown adult. Do you see where I'm going with that? invite people into those special relationships so that they can see, they can give you 
feedback. They can encourage you. They can kind of see maybe what you're not seeing or help give you advice or counsel throughout that relationship. So dating or um, prior to marriage, I would say invite those special people into your life so that they can speak into it. And, um, and that's a great way to prepare for what God has in front of marriage too. That's good, yeah. And going on to what you said about even writing and journaling, it was real funny. Um, there's a story actually for me and Hannah. Um, Hannah and I, Hannah actually journaled, and she wrote a she wrote a journal um, one year, and it was what it was like a when you were like 16, yeah, 16 years old, and she actually pulled out the journal right before I actually got engaged to her, and actually in the journal it showed a description of who her husband was going to be. Yeah. And what's wild about this, guys, is as I was reading through, it literally described mm-hmm. every key trait related oh, yeah. to that, which yeah. is insane. Yeah, um, that's how I feel. I mean, I feel like in the spirit, mm-hmm. I've known my husband yeah. forever. Like, I know who he is. I ask God to give me clues and indications, like, who is this man? Because I don't want to make the wrong decision and link up with somebody that God doesn't didn't yeah, ordain for exactly. me. And so, I mean, and I'm not talking about like what color his eyes and like you know, <laughs> not that kind of stuff. It's what's his heart like, what's his character, what's his nature. And I, I can tell you with absolute confidence, I know him. Mm-hmm. I know him. I will know him when when that happens. Awesome. Yeah. Well, let's go on to the next one. Sweet. Pop up with the next one. We're gonna actually, this one I thought was such a good question. I love this question. It says, if there are thousands of other planets and galaxies in our universe, why would God choose us? We are so little compared to everything else. So why would God focus on us? I love this question. Yeah, this is a good one. I'm looking at your faces like, what's she gonna say? <laughs> what's she gonna say? <laughs> um, this was the most, like, Theologically in depth question, I think that you've gotten. Yeah. Um, These are from really, one of the students. Yeah, that's so awesome. Wow, that's and awesome. I think those are questions worth asking. And, and here's what I can tell you we can go into this big theological thing, we can go through all this, you know, doctrines and these different schools of thought from different theologians and stuff. Um, we could dig through scriptures and have our speculations. And, and I, I'm, an, I'm a total nerd. Like, I'm a total nerd. So I do love that. Um, but can I just answer that by saying, it's okay to say I don't know. I'm not really sure. Can that be okay? Because sometimes when it comes to questions like these, the deep ones, just want to know. Well, my Bible says, lean not on your own understanding, but in all your ways depend on him, and he will make our paths straight. And can it be okay that our minds cannot possibly comprehend all of who God is and why he does what he does, or the things that are in the unseen realm, you know, the spiritual realm? There's He made our brains limited in what we can understand, because can you imagine if we had like, now, we have the mind of Christ, so let me be careful as I walk this tightrope here. Yeah. Um, we do have the mind of Christ with Jesus as our Lord and Savior for sure, but um, I think that there, he knows that there's certain things that we, we just can't understand because he's God, we're not, and we need to be okay with that. We need to be okay with not being God. There is only one. And let me remind you that the enemy, his deepest desire, was to be like up. Yeah. Right? Mm-hmm. So let's take caution when it comes to that. Um, what I can tell you is, can it just be okay that that maybe we don't have all the answers, but maybe we go throughout our life and, and it's okay to ask and it's okay to seek and it's okay to seek God's heart on things. And it's okay to allow Holy Spirit to give you wisdom and revelation throughout your life and for him to change your mind, you know? Um, him to kind of uh, give you greater levels of awareness. Um, all I know is that he lo- it's love. Yeah. That's the only and best answer. As simple and profound as that is, it's because he loves us. And sometimes we don't always understand why people love us. I can be very hard to love. 
you know, I'm, I'm human, I mess up. Um, so to accept the love of God, I think was one of the hardest parts of my own faith journey, was accepting that I'm loved. Yeah. Yeah, I think on, on that too, um, after Hannah and I met, she actually sent me a video, literally, like I think after like the first two weeks of us meeting, and I think one thing too, she showed me a video, and it's actually Louis Giglio. You guys have heard of him. Louis Giglio um, is the lead pastor for Passion, so maybe you've heard their music on, um, you know, you hear it on the radio or whatever, um, a lot of times, but I thought it was really interesting. He, he did this whole message uh, back in like 2004 or 2005, and it was really interesting, and he was talking about how like everything God made in his image, and it says that specifically in scripture. God made oh, yeah. in his image everything. So, um, and I think this is what's really cool. The idea of why God would choose us. And I actually was talking to a friend yesterday about it. I said, man, this is like good. This question I'm trying to even grasp. So, um, but the idea of why God chose us, and it's crazy. If we actually look back when Jesus was around, God made Jesus in his own image. So if God made Jesus in his own image, why would God send his own son to die for us? Because he loves wow. us so wow. much, and love is the key. Mm -hmm. But what's really interesting is, you hear that key thing, God made us in his own image. And so if God made us in his own image, what that's specifically saying is, us as human beings, as us as people, God made in his own image. Meaning, this is his description of how he sees us. And that's why he's chosen us. It's it's love that is unimaginable to the point to where we actually do not, we can't comprehend it. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You know, it's a lot. It is. Mm -hmm. It's a lot, a lot. So let's go on to the next question. Um, we'll kind of go on to the next one. And then thank you guys. If you guys are, what time is it? 11.45. We still got time. We'll okay. get through them. Okay. Thank you guys for tuning into the live yes. stream. If you guys are watching, so really appreciate it. Um, it helps us a lot, and this is something that yeah. we're grateful for just to have an opportunity in doing. Absolutely. So, Super exciting. Yeah, it's it is. first one. Exactly. Not the last. So, I don't know. <laughs> All right. So, the next one is, I love this one. This one is, is relatable to a lot of sense because a lot of us go through it. How can I deal with my friends leaving mm -hmm. me behind and lying to me? And the idea of this whole question is, I find it crazy because that's actually in high school nowadays, even when I was in high school, like I saw people, it's almost in a sense the question's asking like, how do you deal with when people backstab you? <laughs> yeah. In a sense, you know, when people, people completely just oh, yeah. are against you, they, they turn you around a whole 180 and just completely don't. How do, you, how do you deal with that? How can you comprehend the idea of your friends leaving you behind and lying to you. Those aren't your friends. <laughs> yeah. Um, first off, I want to say, how, how many of you have been betrayed, backstabbed, hey. friends leave your life, lie about you, accuse you of something, throwing you under the bus? Nobody? No Come one. on, we've no had no, 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 there's got to be no some one. people. No one. Why are y'all lying? We need to repent from lying. Raise your hand. It's happened, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I just want to first, um, I want to speak into the fact that it's painful and it hurts and I'm sorry that that happened. Let that be the apology that you may never get. And let me be really honest, because that's all I know how to be. Mm -hmm. yep. Get used to it. That's my advice. Yeah. As far as backstabbing, people walking out of your life, you need right now to understand that you need to get used to it. Because if you don't, then you will continue to be hurt and sideswept and uh, run over and uh, just annihilated at the, the pain that that can cause in your life. So if you know that from this day forward, throughout the rest of your life, you will have that happen again, then it's a little bit less painful when it does happen. I can tell you. Um, at 33 that I've had more I have so many stab wounds in my back I, it is insane yeah um, 
but I can tell you that my friend Jesus knows all about that on a level that I will never understand. The beatings that he took, you know, yeah. the, the stripes on his back uh, far surpass anything that I could ever comprehend in betrayal or whatever. Um, I heard Christine Kane. Have you ever heard of Christine Kane? Yes? Love her. Um, she had said once on a podcast, yeah. she said, you know, the people that are closest to you are the ones that have the, the knife that could even be stabbed in your back. So it's not the people in the fourth or fifth row. It's not those um, acquaintances that you have that have the emotional capacity to truly wound you. It is the people on your team. It is the people that you allow closest to you. Now we have a choice to make. We can be sociopaths and barricade ourselves from everyone and everything and not become emotional or vulnerable Isolated. or connected with anyone. Or we can just simply reconcile right now it's going to happen and how we respond to that when it does means everything about our character yeah there's four things that came to mind when I was doing a study on this and one of them um, is is the greatest commandment when the disciples asked Jesus what is the greatest commandment in short he said love God and love others there's another place um, in uh, in Matthew 5:44, it's the Sermon on the Mount. It's like Jesus' last like big message, you know, like the, the the big stuff, the last impartation of what he wanted to leave with us. And yeah. and he said, "Bless those who curse you. <coughs> Bless those who curse you." Romans 12:17, it says, um, "Do not repay <coughs> anyone evil for evil, but repay evil with good." It is mine to avenge, says the Lord, I will repay. It's not up to us to retaliate. It's not up to us to get revenge. Do you see what I'm saying? It's going to happen, and it's going to hurt. Get used to it. Go to Jesus. He knows more about that kind of pain than we ever will. We have to um, understand that we're held responsible for how we respond to situations like that. So the answer is you bless them. You love them, you forgive them, you don't retaliate, and you just keep yourself opened up with discernment that God will put other people in your life. There are far many more people in your life, friends and people like that, that you'll confide in and be trust, trust in your life that will not do that than the few that will. Don't focus on the few that backstab you. Focus on the ones that will weather many storms and walk through many seasons of life with you because they're they are few guys They're few. Yeah. Here's what I can tell you as far as whether I was young and even now is sometimes I have so much high expectation for the friends in my life thinking they're just they're the the lifers mm -hmm. and some people are just seasonal yep. And we have to be okay with that yep. That's good. That's actually and it's really good. Um and even with that, I think one thing too, um, man, I've gone through that like so much. And then I even like have gone through the times of like question, like, why is that happening to me? Why am I going through that? And what I often find too is, in a way, it also is sometimes God puts them through, puts us through it, and it's so hard to even comprehend as to why. But in the sense, like it's almost like God puts us even through these friends, and He knows, He completely knows how our life turns out. But sometimes he even puts those seasonal friends and those really, really close friends there for a reason. And for one, just like you said about your character, it reveals your character. That's right. But also, it builds your character. That's right. Because your character, as time goes along, guys, when you get out of high school, your character is going to completely change over time. Mm -hmm. And it's going to be your decision to actually decide what you want to do with it, what you want to do with your own life. And you have the choice, you have the free choice to do what you want, whenever you want. Yeah. And so it has to be through your own character to decide on those things. Yeah. You know, who you want to surround yourself with. Right. And I find it funny, I've only, I only have like three close friends, three or four close friends. And then I don't really try and like fully engage with so many people. And the reason behind that is because those three or four friends are the people that I'm surrounding myself around who are, have the same mindset, they have the same vision behind what the accomplishment of what I'm in. 
they have the same goal, the end goal of it. And I find this funny. I was listening to a podcast the other day, um, and it was really, really cool. And um, basically, it talked about the Trinity, the Father. You, some of you guys know the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Those are the three. But what's really funny about that is God works in threes. You have the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. You need three close friends in your life who are going to be there for you through the runs, and over time you'll find those. It's not just gonna happen right away, but it's gonna be over time you're going to find those people who are your close friends. And you need specifically, out of those three, you need one person who is your complete person you trust, the person who you can go to, whether it's your spouse, or whether it's, it's a, a, your best friend, who will completely be honest with you about everything. Those are vitally important because you need them. Um, truth tellers, yeah. Truth tellers. And I think those are important. And that also is a way you can build your character sure. over time. So it's because the influence matters. That's right. How you're influenced. Absolutely. And so let's pop up the next question. We'll go with the next one. I like this one. This is a really good one. And it says, how do I avoid dry seasons in my life? while still being committed to the things I'm committed to. Mm. So I'll repeat that one more time yep. for all the people who are listening. How do I avoid dry seasons in my life while still being committed to the things I'm still committed to? When you say dry season, like tell me in like three words what that means. When I think of dry seasons, I really think of when you're struggling, like when you, when you when you're going through, when you specifically are doing so much, you have your entire schedule loaded all the time, okay. completely, and you're trying to find a way to where you can rest your spirit. Oh God! Okay. So, yes. Okay. Because that is so okay. big, and your spirit is literally your health. Mm -hmm. You know. Yeah. Thanks for clarifying. Because um, some people would define maybe a dry season as being like that quiet space with God where you're like, what's going on? What am I doing? What am I supposed to be doing? Like, I don't really feel like I'm hearing from him. Am I doing the right thing? Am I on the right path? That kind of yeah. thing. Um, and I've, I've experienced that too. Um, so you're talking about a time where you're like loaded up, you're busy, you're, you're stretched to mm -hmm. capacity. Yeah. And how do you just continue to maintain the uh, stamina? One of our students asked this, which is great. Okay. This is a really good question. Yeah. So I, I, I live a very full life. I have capacity, and I stretch my margins a lot, meaning that I schedule. I, I live by, like, a Google Calendar color-coded <laughs> boxes that tells me, like, what I need to be doing, you know, appointments I have, ongoing things, even tasks, to be honest with you. Like, I literally schedule the time I do my laundry. Mm -hmm. I schedule the time where, you know, with family and friends, I make sure I, I, I try and schedule that, do you know mm -hmm. what I mean, and not waver from that, because I do live a, a fairly full life, and I also know that I'm being postured, I'm being, I, this is practice for what God has for me in the, fall, in the following seasons of my life, so if I can figure this out good now, and find that rhythm, and yeah. find out how to set boundaries for myself, um, then I know that uh, in seasons coming, then I'll be a little bit more equipped. And I would say that is true for you. If you guys are feeling that, you're having a busy schedule, you know, you have extracurricular activities, friends, school, sports, uh, church, yeah. what have you, um, it can feel like a lot. I would say, um, oh gosh, there's so many different areas we can go with that, but I would say uh, the things that are, stop focusing on the things that are not important and stressing about it. Mm. It's good. Know what your actual priorities are, like the things that you can't let go of, you can't slip up on, you know, the relationships that matter to you most, and learn to be okay by saying thank you and no thank you. Yeah. And that's something I'm continuing to learn, so if you can learn that now, you'll be way ahead of me, yeah. okay? If you can get that figured out now, then as time goes on and you go in college and you have to manage your life yourself, you don't have parents, you don't have other people kind of holding you accountable, it's really going to set you up for better success. 
especially even when you get jobs and you start getting into the workforce or whatever God is calling you into, you'll have more of a rhythm on, on how to manage your own self. It's up to you to manage you. Mm. Do that with the guidance of the Holy Spirit. Um, but I want to tell you, that question kind of indicates when, how do you stay committed? I'm going to tell you that there's going to be a lot of feelings. Yeah. And here's what I want you to get out of this. Your feelings are indicators, not dictators. Your feelings indicate where you're at and what you need and what you're lacking. But they're not dictators of your life. Yeah. That's good. Yeah, that's really good. I think with uh, the dry seasons too, guys, I've gone through so many dry seasons where I have loaded myself with work. Um, whether that's constantly, like there was one point where I was serving, um, you know, at another church and I was constantly serving, where it was an every week thing. Oh, yeah. And you have to set a boundary oh, for, for yourself. Sure. There has to be a line that you have to say, okay, I can do this, but not as often. Yeah, totally. And, and there's nothing wrong with having a fully loaded schedule. But the, the thing, the, uh, the process of that is you need to figure out, and how you said too, is figure out what's important, what is valuable in your life, what's going to better you. Yeah. And focus less on the things that don't matter and are only in, in that moment in time. Maybe they matter, but they don't matter in the future. Yeah. Um, and I find it crazy because I've gone through this. And you have to set that boundary. So as time went along, guys, what I ended up actually doing is I told my leader, I said, hey, I feel like I'm doing a, a lot. I need to take a step back a little bit. Mm -hmm. And one way of doing that is I said, start scheduling me not as often to do things. Yeah. Because that's actually, that will help better me. And as I found over time, it actually helped me be able to balance my life better. Mm -hmm. Help me kind of figure out things and kind of know where I'm at. Yeah, so, is this helpful to anybody? Yeah? Good. Take mental notes. <laughs> Take notes at home. Okay. All right. Go ahead and pop up the next one. Who wants this next one? What time is it, by the way? Someone, somebody have a time? Twelve o'clock. Twelve o'clock. So we're gonna wrap it up soon. They don't start coming in until like twelve fifteen, twelve twenty. Okay. So we're okay. Um. So, what is the best way? Somebody from social media actually asked this question. I thought this was interesting. This is really cool. They said, "What is the best way to know?" and tune into what God has planned for me. What is the best way to know and tune into what God has planned for my life? Um, I'm at a crossroads in my own life where I'm asking God a lot of those same questions, and here's what I've learned. This is important. That the world's response to that is find the path of least resistance. Do you agree? As kingdom people, as children of God, can I challenge you that we are warriors of righteousness? Yep. We are ambassadors to the kingdom of God. We are representatives. We represent Jesus. And it is up to us to not pull back when things get hard. When there's issues that arise, we do not retreat. The word tells us in Ephesians 6, where it talks about the armor of God, which I, have you done an armor of God study yet? Yeah, and, well, we haven't done it yet, but I have seen the whole, the, I actually went over one time, we had a little small group discussion fully where we were circled around. We went over those actual pieces of armor. Sweet. And, um, you know, I Sweet. know that there was a whole script, there was a whole booklet or whatever, study yeah. guide of actually that, who was it with, Priscilla Shire, I think? Yeah, I think it was. Okay. Yeah. It was great, yes. Okay. Um, the armor of God is super important, but in the verse where it's talking about the armor of God, it says so that you can confront, um, like the enemy. Meaning, when we're armored up in the full armor of God, and Isaiah will take, Pastor Isaiah will take you through that, um, what you need to know is it's not so that when bad stuff comes knocking on our door, well, we're all armored up and we can handle it. Okay, that's a passive way, and, and we do, and that we do need to be armored up when that does happen. But I believe that as people of God, as representatives of Christ, as, as ambassadors of heaven, that he has given us this dual citizenship. He's put us here on that planet so that we can help partner with God to transform this earth into the likeness of his image. When Jesus was talking 
um, when in his response was, how do we pray? And he, he gave the Our Father prayer, you know that one? Our Father who art in heaven. Yeah, you get me? Okay, that wasn't verbatim what we need to pray. It's the heart of how we pray. Mm -hmm. On er, thy kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. Ephesians 3.20, it's a very popular Love verse. verse. Yeah. You know, God can do exceedingly abundantly above what anything we can ask, think, pray, or imagine. But what people don't realize is the second part of that verse, which is because of his power at work within us. us. Which means he can do exceedingly abundantly above and beyond anything we can ask, think, or imagine. How? Because of his power at work within us. So when we partner with him, his power then releases onto the earth and we'll see this world transform into the likeness of heaven's image. Mm -hmm. So the question was, how do I, is that what it is? What is the best way to to know and tune into what God has planned for me? Yeah, well just understand who, who, why we're here and what we're called to do. Like I just, uh, that was kind of, you know. But the other thing is we need to know his heart. And how do we know the heart of our Father? Through the Word? God? This is the best way to know the heart of our Father. If you're not in here, how are you going to know Him? Through prayer? Yes. That, that conversation? Learning to shh and listen? Yeah. Not talk his ear off all the time? He actually speaks to us if we listen. And through our personal life experience, that's how we're going to know who God is, who God is, and, and who we are in Him. When we walk through life and we invite Him, and we partner with Him, and we seek Him every single day in every single situation, that's how we're going to get a closer relationship with the Lord. And so, how do we know His plan? We need to know His heart. And how do we know His heart? We're going to know that through His Word. And how do we know the plan on our life? By understanding the commission that He's given all of us, all of us, all of us, all of us. Go out into all the world and make disciples of all nations. That's not a suggestion. Not when you make Jesus your Lord and Savior. The commission is an invitation, and it's not a suggestion. Um, Lisa Bevere, also one of my other favorite humans ever, um, she says the cross is not an ornament. It's not a piece of jewelry. It's an order. It's an order. Which means that we need to know who we are. We need to know who he is. We need to know his heart. Because if we don't know his heart, Isaiah, yeah. and, and and we're all just jacked up, amped up, and excited to go out there and like be preachers of the word and everything, but we don't know his heart, then a religious abuse happens. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? We have weird, funky indoctrination happen. We're leading people astray when we don't understand the heart of our father. You know, the picketing and all the, this, this negativity that's coming from Christians they clearly don't understand the heart of our Father. They might know His Word, but they don't know the heart of our Father. And we have to seek who He is through the, the guidance of the Holy Spirit in understanding His Word. This, this Word is a weapon. Ephesians 6 and the armor of God talks about that. It is a weapon. It is a sword. But we can't be like the, by like Peter and slice off the ears of the very people that need to hear it. This weapon is not to be used on our own team and to backstab our other sisters and brothers in Christ. That is inappropriate. It is meant to help guide us, teach us, train us, coach us, make us into the likeness of Christ's image, character correction, character development, excuse me, course correction. But it is not meant to hurt and to wound the same people that are in our family or on our team. We have to take caution on that. And when we know the heart of our Father, then we're a lot more careful with how we use his word. Mm, that's good. Up on the next one. How do I know I'm headed where God wants me? Somebody else from social media actually asked us this question. And so how do I know I'm headed where God wants me? We didn't do that one. We did. How do I know I'm headed where God wants me? We actually had somebody almost put the they tune into what God has planned for me. But this person actually said, how do I know in the journey where I'm headed? How do I know that I'm going in the right direction? Well, again, I, I want to go back to we, the world says take the path of least resistance. We don't need to be that way. Just because you're feeling resistance on something, it could be that the enemy doesn't want 
helped you to step into what God has for you. Mm, that's good. So as Christians, we've got to take caution for the advice that we listen to and go, oh, well, oh, this seems hard, so therefore it must, God's hands must not be on it. We can't just draw that conclusion right away. Things aren't, things aren't easy. They're not always easy. You know, I mean, yeah. God's called me to do some whole, tremendously hard things, yeah. you know, that I needed my dependency on him for. I, I, it, it went beyond my own skill or talent or experience or whatever, and it caused a, a, a complete dependency on him. And it was hard. Mm-hmm. But it, it left me in a place of being surrendered, surrendered my life to him. So I would say that just because it might be hard doesn't mean God's hand isn't on it. I would say that if you know the heart of your father, if you know his word, and if you pray to him and communicate with him, you abide in him, as John 15 tells us, then you're going to know when God's hand is lifted off something. And you're going to know, okay, hold on, I don't really feel like God's hand is leading me into this. I'm going to decline that job. Yeah. Or I'm going to choose that other school. Or I'm going to break up with that person who God, I um, know this is not God honoring and I don't need to be in a relationship with this person. You're going to know. And it happens through life experience and it happens through your obedience. When you learn to listen and obey what God is telling you to do in your heart and you realize, oh, oh, you look back on your life and you go, thank God I, I listened to that because, man, I could have avoided a disaster. Even yeah. something, Pastor Isaiah, as simple as like take a right turn here. When you're driving, and yeah. you're like, "What? Listen to it. You don't know what you don't know. You know." You, so, get, you get that GPS, yes. maybe, and it's telling you to go this, but you're thinking, "Wait, wait a minute. Wait, like, what? Yo, isn't there an yeah. easier way?" And then I've done that before. And one thing I noticed too is we actually just had that recently happen here because we go to the freeway going back onto the west side of, of Phoenix. You actually will end up often find that. Um, the road is closed right there, the ramp. So sometimes it'll even direct you and say, go to Big Cow. And you'll be like, okay, you know, but you're like, but there's probably a better way if I go down this way. And then you take that way and it's actually a longer distance. And it actually takes longer. And then you actually find yourself, because you didn't actually follow, this is exactly what we're talking about, follow what God has specifically put on your heart to do and it's our obedience to actually try and do that what's funny is when we we tend to feel like maybe we think we have a better shortcut behind things and maybe we feel like that 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 opportunity was is a better opportunity but then often we find that that actually took us further away from our destination where God wants us. And with that said, you know, all things work together, yeah. as we talked about before, but the, there's a part in Scripture, I believe it's in Proverbs, that also says, um, we can make our plans, but the Lord determines our steps. And we have to be okay with Him directing our marching orders. Yeah. So we can have this perfectly laid out plan, this agenda for our life, you know, where we're going, the whole blueprint and whatever, yeah. but we have to stand back, put our hands up, and say, you know what, God? You know what, Holy Spirit? You are the God and the director of my life, and if you say turn here, if you say put that down, if you say quit and leave, if you say jump and move, I'm going to follow you. I am going to put my life, my trust in your hands, and, and I don't need to know all the answers. I'm just trusting that you know what I don't, and I'm going to follow you. Yeah, and I find that crazy, exactly what you're saying on that. The whole navigation thing, we're like, oh, that's like eight miles away. But then it, but then if I take the destination that it's telling me to, it's saying 10 miles. And you think those 10 miles are actually going to be longer, but in all reality, God wants you to take the longer distance, sometimes in order for you to actually get to your destination. And we often find that a lot of times we think we know where we need to go oh, yeah. or the place we need to be. Yeah. And we and think that, <laughs> oh, my life, like in high school, you know what I thought I was going to be? I said, I'm going to play baseball. You know what God said? God literally tore my ro- had me tore my ro- rotator cuff of my arm, and I had to stop playing baseball. God literally put a dead zone yeah. on me, a dead wow. end. And I, and I specifically at this time was serving in ministry. And at the, but it was taking so much of my time that I actually sometimes had tournaments on Sundays and I couldn't attend church anymore. And I was focused on that and God didn't want me there. So God put it as I kept going my way and God put a stop on it. And you'll, over time, as, as you grow, you're going to start going through these experiences where you're going to have these dead ends. You're going to have these stop moments where God stops you. 
And what, what I often find is that through experience, we're gonna learn and discern from like what we need. What's going on, is everything okay? This is when we have 20 seconds remaining. Oh, it's okay. Well, thank you guys for watching. We're gonna end the live stream for you guys. We'll try and see if we're gonna have it up for 24 hours. We're gonna see if we can do that. Promise, promise, try. Um, but let's give a round of applause for everyone joining in. This is really good.